Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Refresh, our online Bible study. I'm excited because today we're going to begin a new series. You know, one of the things about living in the days in which we live, living after Christ came and died and rose again, and living in anticipation of his return, sometimes we look at the Old Testament as irrelevant and passe. I mean, after all, Jesus said that he came to fulfill the law. And so since he came to fulfill the law, what does that mean about the law in our lives today? Are we still required to keep the law? Uh, do we have to keep the dietary laws? Do we have to stay away from pork uh, and things like that? Um, and what about all those other laws? That, what about the Ten Commandments even? I mean, you know, they form the basis really for what we know is, as morality. But are we required to keep the Ten Commandments? So we're going to begin a series today looking specifically at the Ten Commandments and their relevance for today. What does it mean to hold the Ten Commandments in an age of grace, in the kingdom of Christ? As Jesus followers, what do the Ten Commandments mean to us? And we're going to take a few weeks. We're going to look at a commandment a day and see what those say to us, how Christ fulfilled that commandment, and how those of us who are Christ followers can look to that commandment and learn from that commandment and keep that commandment and how we can see its fulfillment in Christ and our relationship to him. So I hope it'll be a meaningful time to you uh, as we look at these very important words and how we are to live them out. So I'm going to lead us in prayer, and then after I pray, we're going to dig into our study. So join me as we pray together. Our Heavenly Father, how grateful we are to you that uh, you love us enough that you have revealed yourself to us. You've helped us to get to know who you are, at least as much as we as humans are able to comprehend and understand. You are an infinite God. You are really beyond our ability to completely fathom who you are, but yet you have revealed yourself to us in ways that we can understand, not the least of which is you revealed your nature to us through your commandments, who you are and what you expect out of life and, and what pleases you, knowing that we could not keep that on our own, knowing that we could not live up to that standard on our own. You sent your son, Jesus, to pay for our sin, to be the fulfillment of the law's demands, to live that perfect life that we could not live, and to die that death that we should have died so that we could have the life that we don't deserve. Thank you so much for that, Heavenly Father. Jesus, thank you for being our Redeemer, our Comforter, for being the one who is restoring us, the, the one who is our, our link to God and has made it possible for us to be right with God. You are the Son of God, and we praise you and give you glory. Holy Spirit, today, we invite you to instruct us and to teach us. You have the mind of Christ, and you have access to the heart of his followers. So today, would you make it clear uh, of our life in Christ and how he has fulfilled the law for us, but how we live that law through him. For it's in that great name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Now let's dive into our study. So as we dig into our study of the Ten Commandments, right up front, I just want to kind of mention three things about what we call the law. To understand Old Testament law, we have to understand that there are three expressions of the Old Testament law. Uh, first of all, there is the, the ceremonial law. Uh, that is the uh, different feasts and festivals, uh, the different sacrifices that they brought, and when they were to bring particular kinds of sacrifices, when they were to offer those sacrifices, how they were to offer those sacrifices, the sin offering, the guilt offering, um, all those different types of offerings, and um, also the, the uh, rituals for purification. Uh, if you had touched a dead body or you had become unclean in some other way, uh, what steps you went through in order to once again be uh, declared pure and clean. Now, understand, when we talk about Christ fulfilling the law, this is the part of the law that Christ fulfilled. 
It's he who makes us righteous. All of those sacrifices pointed to him the time that he would come and make the final perfect once for all sacrifice for sins. And so we don't need to bring lambs and bulls and goats to church when we come on Sunday. And I'm thankful for that. Uh, he took care of all of that. The second expression of law we see is what we would call the civil law. And those deal with interpersonal relationships. Now, a lot of these laws, when you read through the Old Testament, especially the first five books of the Bible, you hear a lot about, you know, if your mule does this to your neighbor's property, then you do this. Or, you know, if this person wrongs you in this way, you take it to the, uh, bring it to the council and they talk about it. And this is what happened. You know, all those different ways, because you see, Israel was unique in that it was a theocratic nation, but yet it was uh, a religious nation. Uh, they they were a people, a nation, but they were literally, they were the first nation, one nation under God. And so this was the way that they were to relate to each other. Now, a lot of these civil laws are, are kind of archaic in their the way they are expressed in the Old Testament. For instance, most of us don't have mules that may get into the neighbor's pea patch, you know, and things like that. However, what we can learn from that is we can concepts of justice and fairness and right. So we, we learn those types of basic principles. That's a word we're going to come back to in just a moment, principles. But then the third expression of the law that we see, we, there's the ceremonial law, the civil law, and then there's the moral law. And this reveals to us the nature and character of God and his people. These are not so much actions as they are qualities characteristics that are to be that are that are in God and since we are created in his image that we are created to bear bearing the image of God means that we will reflect these moral qualities and characters now sin destroyed that Christ fulfilled this in that he has made it possible for us to be right with God and it's because of that relationship with Christ and because of the Holy Spirit in us that he is in the process of recreating the image of God in us. Romans 8, 29 says that it is our destiny to be conformed to the image of his son. Jesus came and lived, perfectly displayed, showed God to us. And as believers who place, place their trust in him through faith, through the work that he's doing in his Holy Spirit in our life, he is trying to and will one day accomplish the goal of making us like we were intended to live, those original image bearers of God. So as we think about the law in general, I want us to keep those in mind. And I want us to think about this word right here, principles. Now, we're going we're gonna to get to our scripture. We're going to look at Exodus 20. And the first three verses today. But as we look at these Ten Commandments, what we're going to do with each one is we are going to find the principles or the principle uh, behind each commandment. What does it tell us about God? What does it tell us about his image? And then as his image bearers being recreated now through Christ, how is it that Christ wants to produce that type of quality and character in us? And so uh, that's what we're going to learn. So the first commandment that we look at today, the first life principle that we'll see, let's read it together. It's these first three verses. And God spoke all these words saying, I'm the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So the principle that we, we see is that God is the focal point of life. God is the focal point of our life. He wanted Israel to know that. Now, there are two ways that he went about demonstrating that. First of all, what he did 
he initiated a personal relationship. He did that in two ways. He told them who he was and what he had done. Notice what he says, I am the Lord your God. Who? The Lord. Now you will notice how Lord is spelled here with a capital L and then the O-R-D in smaller capital letters. Whenever you're reading through the Old Testament and you see Lord spelled that way, that is the way translators translate the name of God. In fact, some translations now, even instead of putting the word Lord spelled that way, they put in the name of God, Yahweh. He is giving them his personal name, a personal relationship. I am Yahweh. This is who I am. And what has he done? I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, notice all of this is God's initiative that God took the initiative to do that. I brought you out. Uh, I went down there and I got you and I snatched you out. And you know the story of the Exodus. You know the story of the wandering in the wilderness and God implanting his people in the land of Canaan and making that uh, the land that he had promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. So this was a personal relationship that God initiated. I want you to understand that God has initiated a personal relationship with us through his son, Jesus. Romans 5, 8 tells us that God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. John chapter 1 and verse 12, he came to his own and his own did not receive him, but to as many as would receive him, to them he gave the right to be called the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. God initiated, God started all of this. He, he has pursued you and he wants this relationship with you. He has done everything necessary to make this relationship possible. He initiated a personal relationship. But the second thing we see in this command, uh, he said, you shall have no other gods before me. Literally, that means in front of. Really, it means the word is translated there is face. But in their, their language, when they talked about something being before the face of, they meant in front of either facing it face to face or out in front of it either way. So what God is saying is there should be, there should be no other gods uh, in line with me. So not only did he initiate a personal relationship, but he pursues an exclusive relationship. He pursues an exclusive relationship. Uh, he said, before me, no other gods before me. Now, he was talking to a group of people who, uh, up until this time, uh, they had their starting a point way back when God called Abraham from a little town called Ur, which was kind of at right close to the Persian Gulf in, in what would be modern-day Kuwait. And in the culture of Abraham, as Abraham grew up, there were a lot of different gods. We call we call them polytheistic. They believed there was a a god of the sun, a god of the moon, a god for rain, a god of the harvest, a god of fertility. And not only were there gods for all of everything in life, there were corresponding goddesses. And so they constantly had to worry about which god or goddess they had to appease to be able to bring about the circumstances that they wanted. But God said no. That is not the case. We, I'm to be the only God for you. We call that being monotheistic, one God. God said you have no other gods before me. Now, they came from that background, but Abraham believed only in the Lord God, believed only in Yahweh. Now, he had not been given the name Yahweh. That was later uh, given to Moses, uh, but, but he knew this one God revealed to him all along his journey. And that was the only, he had this exclusive relationship, this exclusive covenant relationship with God. Now, when they 
wound up in that when they wound up through Canaan, they they were introduced to all of these Canaanite gods. You read about all of those in the Old Testament. We won't take time to go into all of those. And then they wound up in Egypt, enslaved in Egypt, who had a myriad of gods, not to mention their emperor was considered to be a god. And so now they came out of Egypt. They were wandering through the wilderness where they encountered other cultures who had multiple gods. And they would be going into the land of Canaan again, where there are gods all over the place. But God was saying from the beginning, you're different. I'm the only God. You're not having any other gods before me. Now, what does that mean to us in the New Testament? Because quite often when we think of false gods, we think of the little wooden statues or stone statues or golden statues or whatever. And, you know, we think of something that people build a little altar to in their home. But an, but an idol or a god with a little g is anything that competes for our attention and more importantly, our devotion. Some people make their job a God. I mean, they will just give everything to their job because they, the reason they do is because they want the money. And they want what the money can buy. They want the possessions. They want the status in life. And so they they pursue things. And so this life becomes their God or they become their own God. And they want to make their life, you know, all about making themselves happy and pleasing them. Some people treat their family like God. Uh, some people, you know, you can even treat church like God. Uh, we can go through all the motions, the religious motions, and never really find our heart devoted to the God that we claim to worship through our religious activity. Uh, religious activity does not necessarily equate devotion to God. Uh, you can't have devotion to God without the religious activity, but you can have the religious activity without the devotion to God. So, you know, sometimes we just, we're satisfied going through the motions because it makes us feel good. We, we sing the songs, pray the prayers, attend the meetings, go to, you know, do all the things we're supposed to do uh, so that we can check them off on our list and say, look what a good religious person I am. It makes us feel good about ourself. Again, ourself has become God in this case. God is saying, no, no other gods except me. He has initiated a personal relationship with you through his son, Jesus. And as such, he pursues an exclusive relationship with you. Now, let me close out by taking us to a New Testament verse to remind us about this truth in the New Testament form. He, that is Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. He is, so he's the head, He's the beginning. He's the firstborn from the dead, not meaning that he's the first one to ever rise from the dead because he raised people from the dead. But he was the prototype. He is the heir. Uh, he has the firstborn privileges. He gets the inheritance uh, of the resurrection so that in everything, and it's in everything, he might be preeminent. That means first place or Prominent. Now let me let me draw you a, an analogy here. If we use the word priorities, and I were to ask you what are your priorities, you would immediately come up with what we would call a linear list. Well, number one, my first priority is my relationship with God, and then comes my family, and then my job, my church my health, and you could go on and on and on down the list. And we say, well, you know, God is at the top of my list. Now, the problem with that, by saying that God is at the top of my list, is that I could conceivably give God 51, well, we could even, we could even draw that closer. We could give God 50.1% 
of our time, effort, and everything else, all the others together could get 49.9% and we could leave God out of it. I can try to be a family man without my relationship with God. I can try to work my job without a relationship with God. We talked about it earlier. We could even try to do church without God. I couldn't, I could try to manage my health and my finances and my neighbors and my leisure, all these other things on my list. I could try to leave God out of that. But as long as I keep God in the, in the important places, like I go to church every Sunday and I, I pay my tithe and I do all these religious things, then that shows God is my priority. That is the wrong way to look at it. I like to think of it this way, and I believe this is what Colossians 1.8 teaches us. In everything, not over everything, he wants to be the prominent one. So then everything flows out of my relationship with Jesus, my family, my job, my church, my health. my possessions, my neighbors, my leisure. So you see, here's the difference with that. God has pursued a personal relationship with me and initiated a personal relationship with me through Jesus. When I receive Jesus into my life, he begins to transform me into the image of God so that the image of God begins to glow in all the other facets of my life. I am the father and the husband. I need to be only as I follow Jesus. I am the model employee that I need to be only as I follow Jesus. You see, these work both ways. My church only pleases God when my church is pursuing Jesus. Jesus has the answer for my health. My health issues are a matter of being a steward of the body he's given me. Uh, I relate to my neighbors in light of who I am in Christ. My possessions belong to Christ. My leisure uh, is, is subjugated to Christ. So this is what this first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's how that plays out for the New Testament believer. There are a lot of things that compete for our devotion. And we like to think we're pretty good because we give God a pretty good bit of our time. But what God asks for is not to be one of the things in our life. He asks to be our life. Jesus doesn't want to be a part of your life. He is your life. God has initiated a personal, think about that, the creator of the universe, a personal relationship with you through his son, Jesus, receiving Jesus as our savior, repenting of our sins and surrendering our life to him begins us on a journey of restoration where God begins to put back into place in our life his image that would normally be reflected through us, but that sin has tainted. Doesn't mean we don't sin anymore. Doesn't mean that we're perfect. But God begins this process of making us more like Jesus and John 1 tells us that Jesus showed us the Father. So if we want to bear the image of the Father, we bear the image of Jesus. The whole work of the Holy Spirit in our life after we're saved is to recreate the image of Jesus in us. Our role then is to surrender to that, to believe that, to believe that God is at work in our life, to believe that he can and will do that, to believe that allowing Jesus, first of all, to shape us, and then from what Jesus is doing in our life, for that to affect all the other facets of our life, our family, our job, our church, our neighbors, our health, whatever the case may be, our finances, our possessions, to allow what Jesus is doing in us then to work out through us, to believe that that reveals the image of God in us and that he can and will do that and wants to do that and gets glory in that is where it all happens. So as we look at this first commandment, you shall have no other gods besides me. Consider your life. Where's Jesus? Is Jesus part of your life or is he your life? Do you live your life every day letting Jesus live through you? As Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ 
lives in me. And this life that I now live in the flesh, I'm living by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Spend time in God's word. Let God's word shape you and mold you. Let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you. As you pray, ask Jesus to form his image in you and watch what begins to happen as the image of God begins to show in your life. You begin to see all these other things not as competing affections and devotions, but you see them as blessings that God has given to you, and you see them as opportunities to reflect Christ, and they get put in their place. They're not, they, they subtly become God if we're not careful, but when we put Jesus in the preeminent place in everything of our life, things fall into their proper order. So I hope that is a blessing. It gives you some things to think about and pray about. Ask God how he wants to apply this specifically to your life. Ask him for specific cases of where some things may be competing for preeminence in your life. And ask him how, to, how you can make Jesus, once again, preeminent in all things in your life. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you next time.